Hi, I'm Sam Solomon, the host of Signal Tower, the show where we talk about startups, design, and education. Today I'm joined by Jerome Chu, who is a human experience designer. He is the co-founder of Wizimo and an organizer for TEDx Georgia Tech. Jerome, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sam. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, why don't you tell me to begin with, you know, what what is a human experience designer? Okay, so um, a human, so I kind of started calling myself a human experience designer early on because of I wanted because I wanted to really s- separate the definitions of an experience designer and an interface designer so you know if you go on you know a lot of job sites like indeed or monster.com you'll find that UX designers often get piled on with the category of UI designers and uh, short for user interface designers and right. I really don't think that's an appropriate um, designation or appropriate definition for experience designers. Um, so, the kind of the idea of human experience design for me is a culmination of the experiences that I personally have helped curate and help design. And these can range anywhere from events to um, experiences with brands to um, even you know experiences with your web app. Perfect. So I guess kind of what what goes into designing a great experience? Sure. Um, I think what starts is what starts it off is empathy. Um, a lot of a lot of the design work I do in terms of you know with events and uh, and brands and products is. You know, a lot of people actually get locked into tools like Balsamic, like Azure, right. and they think that's experience design, and and maybe maybe it is for their world. Um, but to me personally, the way I define experience design is is a completely intangible or intangible skill where you can actually sit in the user's shoes and completely empathize with your customer um, or your user, and you know, it's it's really being able to turn that that knowledge that you gain from being empath- or empathetic to something that's to a it's product, brand, or event experience that actually caters your user really well. Um, that's that's interesting. That's got, so yeah. it's 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 not it's not something that's specific to like one medium. Like you think of as interface design. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I you know I I think that the def you know the word experience already has a very mediumless definition. You know you when you think of an experience you don't really what what's a good experience? You you might think of you know traveling in Spain. You might think of um, you know going skydiving. But you know when does ev- anyone say that? iOS 7 is a great experience. <laughs> like, you, you never think that. Um, and yet, experienced designers are, could be an iOS designer. Um, and it, it doesn't really make much sense to me, but I guess, you know, that's kind of the definition that society has given it. Yeah, and I guess with iOS, everyone's kind of worried about the icons right now. If you go on to Dribbble, everyone's <laughs> redesigning all the icons for iOS. Oh, yeah, so. yeah. And I don't know if you've seen, like, kind of the control center that comes up that um, looks like, I don't know, you've got, like, bubble gum exploded over the background or something. It's, yeah. it's just got the craziest colors. Yeah, i got to believe that Apple will figure it out, you know, by the time it's, by the time uh, the, next, the next update rolls around. So, yeah, we'll see. Well, let, let's talk a second about learning. I know that that's something I'm extremely interested in. I know that's something you're uh, extremely interested in. What would you say your philosophy is about learning? Okay. Um, I think we were all born to learn already. And society has kind of developed this idea that learning should be extremely structured. Um, you know, as if we're, we're a vessel to be filled. And I'm actually quoting someone here, and I don't remember his name. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, the quote goes something like this. Um, society thinks that learning is a process where we're, as a student, 
a vessel to be filled. But really, what we are is a, you know, a fire to be lit. And I've always thought that was interesting because, you know, if you think about it, as kids, a lot of the things that we learned, we never actually were taught in a classroom. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> you know, you didn't learn your first words in a classroom. Um, you learn by mimicking, you learn by watching, you learn by observing. Um, and I think that's really important because, you know, the best, the best kinds of learning occurs when you're engrossed, in it, you know, and, and sure, you know, lecture halls evolved out of a reason. Um, you know, I think, I think the Greeks started doing it first. Um, but it's, I think it started really as a, as a means of passing on like information, like true factual information um, to a group of people at one time. And that makes sense at that time because they didn't have the internet. Um, <laughs> but now we do. So we don't actually need lecture halls anymore. Um, but, you know, Khan Academy could do just fine for any kind of memorization classes like biology, uh, like chemistry. Yeah, I, I really like the analogy with the vessel and the fire. Um, the one I always feel like I end up using is is like the factory. School is like a factory for learning right now, as opposed to it really should be like a garden or a farm. You know, everything is in the factory is extremely structured. It goes down the assembly line um, when really it should be kind of nurtured and kind of given the best environment possible to thrive on its own. Um, you know, that's kind of the like the factory versus the like garden or organic uh, analogy. I just had I just had to throw that in there. No, that um, sounds exactly. What yeah, do you think? Exactly like what What do you think about inspired learning? I, I I'm trying to remember the. There's a a great quote um, about you know uh, you know most teachers teach, great teachers inspire. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how do you feel about that? I think the inspiration part is where is where the fire gets lit, you know. Um, you know, teaching has this connotation of passing knowledge, um, and I believe somewhere in in Oxford, it, 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 that's actually what it's defined as, like the the the, the act of passing knowledge. Right. Um, but to you know. To be, to be learning something that you're inspired to learn is essentially to get to a point where you are literally learning because you want to learn and the teacher does not play a part in this anymore. Right. Um, the teacher could facilitate um, and give you and show you channels of where you could learn, but the teacher wouldn't be able to teach you anything anymore um, because you would be leading yourself down your own path to learning yeah yeah well so you know I what do you think you know in today's world you know what do you think is the the purpose of a college degree how does that you know differ from maybe you know the purpose of college as a whole yeah um, I think a college degree today probably you know you could it used to be considered, I guess, you know, as, as we talked before, shortly before this, that, um, that it's a screening tool. You know, it's, it's used as a way of having a quick gauge as, as a student's um, proficiency, right. ability to thrive and succeed in the company that you're hiring for. But really, you know, that, that, that isn't really required anymore. Um, you know, we, and, and this is, this, you know, you don't even have to see this in companies like LinkedIn. You, you can even see this in what companies are actually asking for nowadays. And it's, sometimes it's ridiculous. Like, you know, you, like an entry-level job could require a year's, a year's worth of experience. And you're like, where the hell did I get that year's worth of experience <laughs> when I'm in school? Um, so it's, it's ridiculous. And, you know, to, to go back to your, to your question, I think the, the purpose of, of college and not not necessarily a college degree is um, or rather the value of college now isn't necessarily being able to develop that that resume or that or to pass that screening test anymore it's really to build networks to learn how you can um, you know I 
I, I really think it's it's probably to build intrapersonal skills because you or interpersonal skills that you never learn while at home. Um, you know, e- even in high school, you're not necessarily working with people um, right. who are your type of people. Well, don't you think there's another way to to kind of build those interpersonal skills without you know spending forty thousand dollars? Oh yeah, it's absolutely overpriced. Uh, <laughs> to, to you know, forty thousand dollars for interpersonal skills. Like if you actually put it that way, that's kind of crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think that's that's a good point. Um, you know, right now, uh, tons of co-working spaces are available, like Hypopotamus in Atlanta. Um, you know, great places that I I know people have thrived socially. Um, or interpersonally, so there's this guy named Matt Smith. Um, he's uh, he's an early founder of Insight Pool. Um, oh yeah, I did an interview with Adam Wexler. Well, uh, we'll probably I think by the time I air this interview, that one will already be posted. But yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Matt Smith is 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 one of the founders there too, and he I I remember hearing a description of him from one of um, the professors here, one of the entrepreneurial professors here at Georgia Tech, and how. Like when he was 16, he was already out there, um, you know, meeting people, learning things. And, you know, as a 16-year-old, I, what was I doing? I was hoping to get that latest PlayStation game for Christmas or something. I don't know. (laughs) Um, I was definitely not an entrepreneurial kid. Um, But I did, I was very passionate about learning and design. All right, so um, earlier this year, the Center for College Affordability did a study about uh, underemployed college students, Um, and they came basically came to two conclusions in their study, that uh, in the future, we would either have janitors with PhDs or college enrollment would just have to drop. Um, You know, what do you think about that? Do you think either one of those is, do you subscribe to either one of those theories? Hmm. I think... I think the model of universities definitely will have to change. Um, I don't think necessarily they'll they'll have to pick, you know, either the the model of having janitorial PhDs or, um, you know, a less enrollment rate from students. Um, I think it depends on how universities are going to start defining themselves. So something like a like Singularity University Rise. is is completely backlogged and probably has an insanely long wait list. Yeah. Um, I applied. I think it, I think after I graduated, I actually, that was like one of the things I, one of the uh, university's uh, secondary education places I did apply to. Yeah. And, and, you know, you personally, like you're, you're completely, you want to go there. Um, and it's because of the way singularity has defined themselves, you know, right. That it's, they're, you know, no lecture halls and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but Singularity is kind of like schools like that are are so different from, you know, you know, just going to get like an MBA, um, Mm -hmm. you know, at at a state school. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of the starter. Like, I don't really can even consider them like universities. They are schools. They do, they do teach things. But Mm -hmm. like the starter league, you know, I guess that's an education, but I don't even put that in the same bracket as like, is my time at Auburn. Right. Um, well, you know, and that and that's where I, that's where the re the redefining moment comes for universities. You know, yeah. they're going to have to start um, being hip per se. You know, they're they're going to have to start saying, "Hey, we're actually a really massive co working space." <laughs> um, and and you know, at at, po- at that at some point, that's going to be what attracts students. Um, you know, we're just a massive co working space with events. Um, and it's not going to be, oh, hey, you can get a prestigious degree from Georgia Tech. Um, because that's just not going to pull students anymore. Right. And, and of course, they're, they're going to have to follow through with that promise um, where, you know, we're not really looking at the idea of signing up for courses or applying for a major anymore. It's probably something more like, okay, what do you want to do? Where, what's the, the nearest path? What's the nearest course you can take to get to that path? Right. Um, and I think having that kind of flexible learning environment will start um, will start showing itself. In fact, in a lot of these, I think I think it's interesting that you bring up the 
the co-working space because it, I have I have been, like I said I've been writing this I've been writing this piece about about uh, right now I'm calling it them residential learning centers but they're really kind mm -hmm. of like what you know happens after because I kind of I subscribe to the people are going to stop going to college uh, mm -hmm. mentality I, th I think that's going to happen I think that's already happening but um, in this piece, they're like at the very end of it, there is something that I think colleges can do. And that is, is, is to scale down and to kind of rethink, you know, what their offerings are. And one of those is they have unbelievable facilities. Most colleges, I mean, most colleges could, op turn, could transform a lot of their centers into co-working spaces. And it'd be, they'd be incredibly tough to compete with. Um, the question is, can they get through all of the bureaucracy and other things that have kind of built up over time with the universities? Um, I think that's going to be, you know, key to what the future of college is. Right. Especially uh, a lot of these public universities, you know, you've yeah, got it's, some old guys up there in the in the Board of Regents. Um. <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh, that's that's I think that's that's going to be that's going to be a, a defining battle for you know what colleges stay afloat and I you know what what sink yeah and and kind of think talk about all this disruption in college um you know a lot of them have you know a lot of people that people say basically i don't need to go i don't need to go to college because the internet can teach me stuff i can mm -hmm. learn things on the internet and uh for people that are interested that you know have that fire uh i think that's fine um you know and and a lot of people are using these massive open online courses to do that uh, you know, I guess kind of what are your thoughts on uh, MOOCs? I think, um, so I'm going to call them MOOCs um, from now on. Just because I've, I've seen that, I've seen that, I've heard that term used a couple times already. And I'm like, that's such a weird way to call that. But, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it. Um, <laughs> I, I think there, there's like two skill. there are two things that you learn um, in, in universities. And, and one of that, is has will be taken over by MOOCs. So it, you learn skills and then you learn tools, right? So when I say skills, I really mean like intangibles, um, right? Stuff like teamwork, leadership, all right, um, ability to work with people. Um, but tools, you know, Python, um, Ruby. It's it's stuff that MOOCs can very very afford very easily and cheaply. Um, teach to hundreds of thousands of people and you know it's it's essentially lecture hall 2.0 um, so anything that you think that should be taught in a lecture hall I mean Khan Academy uh, has probably taught me more engineering than most of my engineering classes and I, I mean that in a in a in an engineering tool sense right um, if I needed to learn physics I'll go to Khan Academy I will not show up for lecture <laughs> That, those videos are usually pretty good too. It's it, sometimes it's tough to stay awake in lectures. It is solid, and and you know, someone Sal was was very particular about making sure these videos are under ten minutes. Yeah. Um, so instead of your hour and a half long physics one hundred and one class, or yeah. Um. So this is this is a question I love. Uh, you know what? You know, how would you go about building, uh, you know, an entrepreneurial culture on college campuses? If it were up to you, you know, what, what steps would you take? Okay. So th that's the kind of question that we tackle here at the a Startup Exchange. Where So a Startup Exchange is a collective of students here at Georgia Tech um, that Ashwin and I founded to try to get student entrepreneurs to think together more entrepreneurially. Because we feel that um, as a group, you know, and you think of, you think of, um, a lot of famous collectives like Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm trying, you know, that's a poor analogy, but um, you know, you can you can uh, humor me for a little bit. But uh, the idea is that people are more inclined to follow through with certain convictions, with certain um, goals, if the people they surround themselves with are struggling through the same thing. And, and so we've got a, all these disparate entrepreneurs on campus at Georgia Tech right now. And we know there's a lot of them out there. Um, right. It might not be a significant number, but there are 
a good number who are struggling and they are hitting walls because our classes are just terrible. Um, and, you know, it's never enough to take 12 hours or even a part-time semester because someone's just going to laugh at you. Um, you have to, <laughs> I, I don't know, I'm making stuff up now. But, huh. you know, to be a full-time student means something. And, and you want to be a full-time student because you want to get out. Um, but the, the idea is that um, Startup Exchange tries to unite these entrepreneurs who are going down the same path, who are struggling with the same things, um, and put them together. And so they can, they can really collaborate with that and really empathize with each other. And I think that's, you know, that's really important um, in a culture. Um, and Seth Godin puts this really well in, um, in the talk he gave to, to a TEDx youth. You know, I have a terrible memory. I really can't remember these places. But, um, you know, Seth mentions that uh, he, he calls, first of all, he calls cultures tribes. So tribes right. are groups of people, you know, essentially the, the definition of, of collective. But when you think of tribe, you think like, you know, you know uh, Native American right. kind of thing. And, and unless you've read, unless you've read his books, uh, unless I've read my, uh, unless I've read his books, which clearly I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so you, you know, he he calls them tribes, and it's it's interesting he calls them that way because um, you know there were North Amer uh, or Native American tribes um, where there wasn't a distinct leader, um, where it was essentially a collective of individuals trying to work towards a similar goal and it worked for them and it worked really well and so I'm gonna I'm gonna actually give a shout out to this book called um, The Starfish and the Spider. Oh that's uh, a fantastic book. That's, <laughs> of, that's, that, that's a great yeah it's a great book I'm also gonna yeah. recommend that. Oh yeah I, I you know I, I was so inspired after reading that and it's it's just it's just fueled a lot of the the core values we have here at Startup Exchange and how, um, you know, we we we're having to actually break it down a little more because yeah, you know, with student organizations it's usually hard to maintain it after like you know the the big leader at the top like right. graduates and then everyone else at the bottom are like well what now, um, but you know and that's why we started it as a collective because we wanted people to come in and feel like they're actually doing something. Um, and it's not necessarily an organization, um, you know, with a hierarchy, you know, like what's the point of a hierarchy? Right. Um, if you want to do something, go ahead and do it. Right. Yeah. So kind of to clarify this, what the book, what the book kind of is about is um, it really tries to explain decentralized organizations and it gives a lot mm -hmm. of really good examples. And so the idea is, um, you know, the spider, you know, uh, you know, if you cut off a leg, you know, it's, it's damaged, but with a starfish, you know, if it cut, you cut it off, it grows back mm -hmm. uh, or no, it splits something like something. It's, it's the analogy it, something like that. Kind of like, if, I think, I think what you meant to do is if you cut off a spider's head, it dies. But yeah, oh yeah, that's, it, that's, 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 yeah, that's yeah. what I meant. <laughs> You, you, you did a much better. Start. It's been a while since I've read it, but it's a, <laughs> it really, it really is a, an interesting book. Oh yeah. Um, so I guess before we kind of got off on that tech tangent, we're talking about, you know, Seth Gooden's TED talk. Um, you organized a TEDx event, uh, TEDx Georgia Tech. Uh, what was your experience like organizing that event? Ooh, it was, uh, it was pretty crazy. I think, I think we didn't set out to organize an event per se. Um, we had a, we had, so Usher and I had a philosophy early on. We, we actually came back, it was like a, so we, we, we did a study abroad program in Singapore, and um, it, was like, it was like a meditated semester for us. We came back almost enlightened um, because we came up with this philosophy called um, the Live for an Idea movement, where from, from then on, um, we were going to do things that uh, push people to live for an idea. And, and the the equivalent of Google's, you know, don't be evil motto right. for us was make shit happen that gets people to live for an idea. And so, you know, that, that was drilled into us. We're like, make shit happen, make shit happen, make shit happen. And um, I happened to inherit 
TEDx Georgia Tech almost completely by accident. Um, I was a photographer for the year before us, and all the other organizers on that team were seniors. And so when they left, they were like, Jerome, you want to have it? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I, I kind of took it and ran with it. And, um, you know, and, and, and we saw an opportunity in using the TEDx Georgia Tech brand um, you know, a widely recognized brand as a way, as a channel to get people to live for an idea, to, to make shit happen. Um, and so, uh, so that was, that was our, our starting process for TEDx. That, that was kind of our mantra for TEDx Georgia Tech. Um, and it really fit into our whole movement, our whole live for an idea movement. And that's why, you know, it, I don't know where I'm going with here, but I think, uh, you know, we see TEDx Georgia Tech as essentially one of many of the um, events, many of the um, programs that we're starting to, to get people to live for an idea. Awesome. So I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, if I was going to go try and, you know, start to organize an event like that, if I was going to organize TEDx Georgia Tech, um, mm -hmm. what goes into trying to figure out you know, you, where do you begin? Okay. Uh, I think I would start with, um, well, so it depends on your university. If, you've, if, you're using, you, if your university already has a TEDx, some TEDx University event, um, I would probably recommend that you steal it from them um, somehow. Uh, plenty, of, this happens a lot. <laughs> um, but, or you could inherit it like I did. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, it, let's, let's just assume that you already have the event itself, the rights to the event. Um, you know, I, I think that if you understood all the wheels, all the cogs that had to go into organizing an event like TEDx Georgia Tech, nobody would organize it. Um, it is just... Nobody knows what they're getting themselves into? No, you know, I think anyone who comes into it for the first time probably underestimates how much effort it takes to, to organize an event like that. And, you know, you, you think about it, it's like a hundred, hundred person, of hundred attendee event. Um, we're actually limited to a hundred. Um, and it's like eight speakers, you know, you've got like one meal. It's, it doesn't sound like a big deal. Um, and, you know, at tap on, tack on that, the fact that we can actually book entire, um, entire lecture halls or entire um, stages for free at Georgia Tech um, and at most universities in fact right uh, it actually does seem like a pretty you know pretty straightforward endeavor um, and then you know and then we start organizing we and we and we get stuff like speakers bailing um, we start having random expenses show up everywhere um, stage lights stage props um, I don't know. Fly, if you're flying speakers over, that's even crazier. Um, and getting getting sponsorship is a is a whole another craziness too, as well, because TEDx has their own rules for sponsorship. Right. So you gotta you gotta work around TEDx's rules. You gotta work around uh, people. It's a it's a it's a totally crazy team leading team leadership exercise. It's like a. Have you seen? Have you heard of the ropes course at Georgia Tech? I've done ropes courses before, and I remember other ropes courses, but I haven't done the one at Georgia Tech. Okay, so at Georgia Tech, they um, they have what is uh, they just recently built a leadership ropes course. So it it tests your ability to work with a team. You know, you go up, and I, I'm guessing you go you work with a team to try to you know navigate the entire obstacle course. Right. Um, so if you take that if you take that concept, and you just like I don't know, qubit, multiply it by ten thousand, whatever the, whatever the um, analogy is. That's that's kind of what we felt what TEDx Georgia Tech was, and it was it was like three months of pure torture. <laughs> yeah, but it, it was totally worth it. So, like, I guess the, the the three main parts of that are kind of like the speakers, the people, and the sponsorships. Mm -hmm. like, how, like what kind of marketing do you like how, how do you go about getting a deciding you know who's going to speak how do you go find these people you just like reach out to them on Twitter and say hey do you want to speak or 
Uh, I think for the most part, a lot of our speakers we knew through our network. So it's it's really important to have um, in your team people who are who are well connected. Um, and it, it's usually not a it's usually not something that you know that you can't find. Um, a lot of the people who want to get involved in TEDx Georgia Tech tend to be people who are well connected, who are right. um, who are very networked in. And so what we did. Um, was essentially sit down in a round table one day and just kind of thought of people that we'd like to have at TEDx Georgia Tech. Um, and a lot of these people were either connected, um, I think at the very max, by the third degree. Um, so like, they, you know, I know someone who knows someone who knows them. Right. Um, which, which, it re which really isn't bad. You know, we, you know, we, we cold call a couple people. Like it wasn't, you know, TEDx Georgia Tech is such a great brand that you, if you just tell them, hey, would you mind speaking at TEDx Georgia Tech? Hell yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> PR, free PR, got it. <laughs> like, they're getting much more value than we are. So, um, yeah, so it's good for them. Right. All right, Wizimo. You're currently working on a startup called Wizimo. Mm -hmm. tell, us, tell us a little bit about that. So, Wizimo is a web app um, designed to help facilitate the interaction between dyslexic students and their reading teachers. So you could think of it as a smart board on an iPad, essentially, um, where we've essentially translated a lot of the physical tools that teachers are using to teach, um, flashcards, sound tiles, workbooks, textbooks, and turning them over to the digital world. Um, and this affords a lot of the, um, the advantages and the conveniences of the digital world. So we can you can think of stuff like data tracking. Um, we, can, we can track scores, we can track um, fluency over time. Um, and this is, this is not new in, in the information world. Like if this is totally, it's been around forever, but this space is so untouched by technology that we've, we found like a massive market um, that we can tap into. Um, and by the way, that is quite easily the best pitch I've ever given for this. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was beautiful. Where, where are the investors at? Where are the investors at? <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad you're recording this because <laughs> I have no idea where I pulled that out yeah, from. We'll cut out, we'll, you, can cut, you can just go like cut out that clip and send it to investors. That was great. <laughs> yeah. um, so like how, how far along are you guys? What, well, you know, what, you know, I guess what kind of stage of a, of a startup are you? So um, I guess... I wouldn't really, I wouldn't be, be able to know, know how to give it a name, but um, well, you don't we, have to give a name. Just like kind of like what, what do, you, what do you guys, what, at what point, like in building the product, are you guys working on or okay. testing the product? So we have um, users testing the product currently. Um, we are going to launch the product for sale in about eight weeks, um, and but we're launching the company itself. You know, all the the, the content marketing goodness and all that in uh, in about four weeks, in about a month. All right, and and from the users that you have, what you know, what's the feedback been like? Oh, the feedback's been great. Um, you know, our our approach for these a lot of these teachers is um, as their teacher's assistant. Um, our motto or our slogan really is "Say hello to your new teacher's assistant." Um, and this is is something that's it's almost unheard of in this in this industry. You know, we've got teachers who spend years and years and years perfecting their art of teaching um, kids with language-based learning disabilities, so um, like dyslexia, and right. they, they often never get recognized for their work. And so when, when our approach is essentially to validate their work, to say, hey, you're a great teacher, and that's why we're trying to help you, um, here's Wizimo, they're like absolutely astonished. and. Um, it's just been it's just been great hearing um, the support the teachers are giving us, and you know even even through our, all our technical bugs um, on our web app, they'll they'll tell us, and um, we'll try to fix it, and we'll 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 get it to them, and they'll they'll come back and be like, yeah, that's great, but you know can can I um you know can I make this color peach, you know, and it, it it's just it they're very responsive with with what um. As as user testing comes, um, one of the more responsive users I've ever I've ever worked with. Well, that's great. How do you how do you find these users? How how do you get in how do you get in front of them? 
So um, my co-founder, Lincoln, um, is actually a licensed and Wilson-trained reading tutor. Um, so he's very well connected to the Atlanta network of private tutors. Um, but usually it really isn't all that hard. I mean, these tutors do want to get their names out. So you can find them on Craigslist. You can find them on a Google search. Um, so, you know, and we, when we reach out to them, you know, one of the first things we tell them is we're trying to help you and we're never going to charge you. Um, and I'm probably going to take that back someday down the road. But um, I know right, right now our revenue model is charging for student accounts, which goes straight to parents. Um, and so the idea is that we want teachers to be able to, you know, worry less about finances, um, be more efficient in their work, and, you know, essentially pass on the cost to the parent who, uh, for, for most cases, don't mind paying um, for something that will help their child. Right, right. I mean, if they're going on a field trip, the parent's going to give them whatever it is, the 20 bucks to go for the, for the lunch or something like that. Right, so. exactly, exactly. Well, cool. What, you, what would you say the, the long-term goal of, of uh, WYSIMO is? I think the, the long-term goal is really um, for WYSIMO to turn into a hub for, um, for families that are families, teachers, parents that are struggling with kids with language-based learning disabilities. So right now, um, you know, a, a big problem that we're seeing as we're working through WYSIMO is that um, students with language-based learning disabilities, and it could be dyslexia, it could be a mild um, form of autism, but uh, if you have it, you probably don't have it diagnosed. Um, because diagnosing any of these um, psychological disorders is, is extremely expensive. Um, and it's also uh, difficult to find a psychologist who's willing to do that for you, uh, especially a competent one. Um, so what a lot of parents are finding hard is that they, they think there's, their, their kids are just lazy and they're just struggling um, because they're just not smart enough. Um, and so what we're trying to do is essentially we hope WYSIMO can be a hub to better inform these parents to show that, hey, you know, you don't actually have to be diagnosed as dyslexic. Um, you might have a language-based learning disability. We don't know what it is, but guess what? We can treat the symptom. We can actually cure the symptom, which is difficulty reading, um, within the next two years. And you know, it's once that disappears, your your whatever whatever your child is inflicted with probably will not have. Um, you know, let me put it this way: if your child has dyslexia, and we know that we can treat um, struggling readers with very individualized tutoring sessions, and within the next couple of years, they should be able to get back on their feet, then you just get all the benefits of dyslexic kids, which is, you know, huge creativity. Um, you know, you've got like, at least Steve Jobs is dyslexic. It's, it's, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, there, there are a lot of people. Yeah, you know, it, it, you're just going to reap the benefits of it, and, um, you know, they just got to learn how to read, and that, um, that's going to get them pretty far. All right. Outside of startups, outside of education, um, what type of things are, are interest you? Ooh, um, I really like traveling. Um, I think uh, after my trip through Southeast Asia, so I took a, I studied abroad last Singapore, or last last fall in Singapore, and um, during that time. Um, I traveled to like seven different countries and That's awesome. it, yeah, and it was just revealing to see all these different cultures, to learn different languages. You know, I forgot most of it, but, um, it's, it's great to, <laughs> it's great to immerse yourself, you know, it, and it's almost, it's almost as if it's an extension of experience design. Um, the fact that I get to immerse myself in environments where I can empathize more, um, you know, because the truth is I, you know, as much as um, I try to keep work out of my personal life, I think that I love understanding people so much. You know, like 
just sitting I, I could I could sit in the Starbucks all day and just stare at people um, and people watching yeah people watching exactly I could I could you know watch the couple over there um, watch the girl slap the guy and leave um, watch the barista um, being extra nice to the to the really pretty blonde um, you know it, it all these interactions are so interesting to me and I and I just want to absorb it you know and it's it's it manifests itself in my traveling because I get to experience all these different cultures. Um, it's like human planet, you know, like animal planet, but human planet, um, like a channel for that. That'd be great if they had them. Well, I think, well, I guess what was the most surprising thing you saw while you were over there? Uh, surprising thing. There's a temple. Um, and I'm sure there are more temples in Thailand, um, specifically in Bangkok, uh, that, Worship penises. Um, it was <laughs> that's not that was not what I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't part of the tour, but you know, we were just stumbling on some temples, and here we go. Um, <laughs> there's a penis in the middle of the room. A um, couple of ornamental rings around it, and people were just like praying to it. And oh man, that <laughs> you know, you you um. That's different. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what to think about it. Uh, but I did, I did sit there and attempt to stifle um, a lot of inner laughter that I that I <laughs> would have been terribly tried not rude. to mean disrespect for. <laughs> that's good. That's great. Yeah. Um, who do you look up to? Um. Wow. I look up to my girlfriend actually a lot. Um, so my girlfriend Kat, uh, she's in Austin right now, and um, one of the traits that she has that I really, really wish I had more. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop into a side tangent here real quick because um, a lot of people say, "Hey, you know, live in this moment. You know, live in the moment. Stop." regretting the past, stop thinking about the future, just live in the moment. And I'm like, dude, I'm stuck in the moment. Um, because I don't usually regret things in the past that I've done, and I'm not very good at, um, I'm going to kill myself for saying this later, but planning things, you know. Uh, I do like to live in the moment, and I, I'm, I feel like I'm stuck in the moment. And because of that, I feel like I don't, I don't look back, you know, I'm very out of sight, out of mind kind of guy, and, um, you know, I feel like if, with all this work that I'm doing, I tend to uh, forget about my friends, forget about my family, um, and cat keep me grounded, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy um, how much uh, cause she, she's absolutely grounded. Like she's, um, she would call her family like once a day. Um, you know, she's well, she's very well, she's ha she has good relationships with her friends and family. And it, it, it's extremely admirable to me, um, how she does that. And I wish I were, I wish I were way better at that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of going back to human experience design, um, where do you draw experience or where do you draw um, inspiration for designing those experiences? Um, people watching. <laughs> uh, it really is a lot about, about people watching. Um, I think... Yeah, I, I, I don't know how how I can draw a very, a very straight line connection between people watching and designing experiences. But um, there's something very raw about absorbing um, these interactions that you see every day that you observe that translates to um, an ability to empathize a lot better. Um, you know, when they say step in your user's shoes, um, to be able to look at your product and close your eyes and then open them again and see it completely differently, that is, that is probably the hallmark 
that I think that is kind of the, the top of the line experience designer that I strive to be. Um, that that I can actually completely can can actually turn myself into a user, like um, almost like an actor. It's weird. Um, that's great. That's yeah. yeah that's I, you've had to, throughout this interview. You've had several moments of like really great clarity. I think that's. <laughs> I think that was good. All right. Well, um, do you have any kind of last thoughts you'd like to share with the uh, with the audience? Uh, no. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm done. I'm packing up. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think um, I think it's great that Sam that you're doing all these interviews. Um, it really. You know, I, I think it's going to help a lot of the startup community get a very um, organic look into, um, you know, all these wide variety of people that you're interviewing. It's, it's, it's really cool. Um, I, was, I actually started going through all these interviews um, that's great. That's, when you emailed that, me. That's, 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 that's my goal. That's, <laughs> that's, that's my goal. I want, I want people to be able to you know, help people to be able to learn from what each what what everyone else is doing people to be able to you know kind of see how people are doing other things and and um i get to talk to interesting people in the process that's great you know that i i envy you for that that you're that you're able to i, I know you mentioned this is kind of your bedtime um <laughs> it's past really, my bedtime it's well, it's 8 it's 8:40 here i'm like oh my gosh <laughs> so late um, but yeah you know it's totally enviable because i i, I think uh, you know that the fact that you're going through all this all this work um and you're and you're clearly passionate about this you know that's that's one thing i've i've learned along the way is that i've when i notice and i see passion in people it's it's very uplifting um and it helps me validate that what i'm doing is is perfectly logical and that it's it's okay to not earn 70k a year <laughs> um <laughs> And in fact, earn less than a third of that um, <laughs> uh, for now. For now, hopefully, right? For now, yeah. So, yeah, it, I, I think that's it's very. I, I admire that. Thanks. Uh, I no, absolutely. I, that means a lot. Um, I guess the last thing is, uh, drone where can people follow you? Uh, so I'm on Twitter at JD Chisel, exactly the way you think it's pronounced or spelled. <laughs> Um, and um, I've got a site come along. Um, it's currently linked to my LinkedIn page, but it's dromechu.com. Uh, but I'll probably forward it to a site that I'm that I'm going to be building. Um, and I'm almost done with actually. So that uh, that's probably where you could find me. All right, all right. I'll I'll link those when I do the transcript. Uh, Jerome Chu, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate you. Appreciate all your right. time.